At this moment in history, where the search for meaning and connection transcends the boundaries of the everyday, a profound vision is presented that offers a renewed understanding of our existence and our place in the cosmos. This perspective, rooted in perennial wisdom and contemporary discoveries, invites deep introspection and recognition of our inner power. As we enter into this exploration, it promises not only an awakening to new spiritual realities, but also a redefinition of what we consider possible, pushing us toward the manifestation of our highest aspirations and a life of harmony with the environment. It proposes a path of transformation that unveils the interconnection between the individual and the universe, highlighting how our actions and thoughts shape our reality. This perspective opens the door to a more conscious and fulfilled existence, where love, peace and abundance are not mere ideals, but tangible, everyday experiences. Through this journey, the possibility of living in synchronicity with universal principles is offered, reaching a deeper understanding of the law of love and the unity that underlies all creation. By immersing themselves in this journey, seekers are invited to unfold their potential, live with purpose and contribute meaningfully to the collective fabric of our reality. It not only nourishes the soul, but also empowers the individual, offering a clear path to personal fulfillment and collective well-being. Metaphysics in the Commandments Emmett Fox Fate Just as like attracts like, like produces like. This is a cosmic law, which means that it is universally true throughout all existence, up to the higher planes. As Jesus said, grapes are not gathered from thorns nor figs from thistles. And he also said, So every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. Matthew 7:17. 7, the same is true of our thoughts, words, and deeds. As we sow, so shall we reap, sometimes almost immediately, sometimes after a long interval. But always, sooner or later, like produces like. Reincarnation also explains the differences in talent that we find between one man and another. The born musician is a man who has studied music in a previous life, perhaps in several lives, and therefore has incorporated that faculty into his soul. Today, he is a talented musician because he is reaping what he sowed yesterday. In the East, this law of sowing and reaping is known as karma, and the term is very appropriate. Keep in mind, however, that karma is not punishment. If you touch a red-hot stove, you will burn your finger. It will hurt, but it is not a punishment, but a benign and reforming consequence, because after one or two such experiences in childhood, you learn to keep your fingers away from the hot iron. The same is true of all natural retribution. You suffer because you have a lesson to learn. Find maturity. Why don't you remember your previous lives? Consider how prone people are to worry and grieve foolishly over the past events of this life and imagine their state if they had the material of many lives to handle in this way. And so the past is mercifully hidden from us until we reach the stage when we can consider our own histories impersonally and objectively, and when we reach that stage, it is possible to remember our previous lives. Our birth is but a dream and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, the star of our life, has elsewhere had its setting and comes from afar, not in utter oblivion, nor in complete darkness, but trailing clouds of glory, we come from God who is our home. Wordsworth is it absolutely necessary to go back? The answer is that you need not return if you concentrate your whole heart on God and seek His presence until you fully realize it. If you can do this of all tasks the most difficult, then you will leave this earthly planet to enter into full communion with God and you will never need to return. Hardly anyone, however, is able to do this at present, and so we have to advance in stages. Learning from experience, study, prayer and meditation living one life after another until at last we grow spiritually. I trust in the mercy of the Lord forever and ever. Psalm 52, 8. Your heart's desire. An old adage says, God has a plan for every man, and he has one for you. Your real problem, the only problem you have, is to find your true calling in life. Everything else will fall into place. You will be happy, and upon happiness health will come. You will have everything you need to satisfy your needs, and this means that you will have perfect freedom. 
for poverty and freedom cannot go together. God has not made you without a definite purpose. The universe is a universe, that is, it is a unified harmony, a divine scheme. It could not happen, therefore, that God could create a spiritual entity like you without having a special purpose in view, a special place for you. Whatever the place may be, there can only be one person who occupies it perfectly. But how does one find one's true place in life? And is there any means by which you can discover what God wants you to do? The answer is divinely simple. From time to time, God himself has whispered into your heart, precisely that most wonderful thing, nothing less than what is called your heart's desire. The most secret desire that lies deep in your heart. That is just what God is desiring you to do or be for him. And the birth of that desire in your soul was the voice of God himself, telling you to rise up and climb higher, because he had need of you. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Psalm 37, 4. Your own place. If you say you are unhappy, dissatisfied, perhaps sick or impoverished, a failure, this is simply another way of putting the fact that you are not allowing God's will to have free play in your life. You are not doing what he wanted you to do. Discontentment is not necessarily a bad thing. It is your duty to be discontent with anything that is not complete harmony and happiness. A healthy discontent with awkwardness, failure and frustration is your incentive to overcome such things. Whoever you are, your true place is calling, and because you truly are a spark of the divine, you will never be content until you respond. Remember that this call is God's call, and when God calls you into his service, he pays all expenses. Whatever you need to answer that call, he will provide, if you will mind his business and not your own. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and appointed you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. John 15, 16. An inexhaustible supply. As far as God is concerned, there is no control whatsoever over the amount of divine energy we can appropriate, nor, therefore, over the things we can do or be. For all practical purposes, however, you can only draw water from the inexhaustible source according to the measure of your understanding, just as you can only draw water from the Atlantic according to the size of the vessel you use. Almost everyone is foolishly content to fill his pitcher, however small it may be, to a very little before he reaches the top. God's true way of working is illustrated by a simple anecdote. A certain man was working in his garden, assisted by his little daughter, who had undertaken the task of watering the lawn with the usual rubber hose. Suddenly he shouted, Dad, the water has stopped. The father looked over and taking the situation in stride said, Well, take your foot off the hose. The ultimate cause of all our problems is precisely this. Behind all the secondary and proximate causes is the same primary error. We have been pressing our feet and the whole weight of our mentality on the pipe of life, and then we complain because the water does not flow. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought. And thou shalt be as a watered garden, and as a spring of water whose waters fail not. Isaiah 58, 11. Self-analysis. Jesus has told us that we always demonstrate our conscience. We always demonstrate what we habitually have in our mind. What kind of mind do you have? Don't let anyone tell you, because they don't know. People who like you will think your mentality is better than it is. Those who don't like you will think it is worse. Just examine your conditions and see what you are demonstrating. This method is scientific and infallible. If an automotive engineer is working out a new design for an engine, for example, he does not say, I wonder what Smith thinks about this. I like Smith. If Smith is against it, I won't try it. Nor does he say, I won't try this idea because it comes from France. He is impersonal and impassive. He says, I will try it and decide according to the results I get. All anyone can do for you is to help you change your thinking. You yourself must keep it changed. No one else can think for you. No man can save his brother's soul or pay his brother's debt, and I will put a new spirit within you. Ezekiel 11, 19. How to get a demonstration. Here is a way to solve a problem by scientific prayer. Get alone and be silent for a few moments. Do not strive to think correctly or to find the right thought, but simply remain silent. Remind yourself that the Bible says, Be still and know that I am God. Then start thinking about God. 
Remind yourself of some of the things you know about him, that he is present everywhere, that he knows you and loves you and cares about you. Read a few verses from the Bible or a paragraph from any spiritual book that will help you. During this state, it is important that you do not think about your problem, but pay attention to God. In other words, do not try to solve your problem directly, which would be using willpower, but rather be interested in thinking about the nature of God. Next, claim what you need. Claim it quietly and confidently, as you would ask for something to which you are entitled. Then give thanks for the accomplished fact, as you would if someone gave you a gift. Jesus said when you pray, believe that you will receive and you will receive. Don't talk about your dealings with anyone. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Isaiah 30, 15. An exciting experiment. Why not make the following experiment, which will not only be thrillingly interesting, but will undoubtedly teach you more in one day than you could learn from books or lectures in many weeks. Here's what you have to do. For one whole day, think, talk, and act exactly as you would if you were absolutely convinced of the truth of the claims that God has all power and infinite intelligence, and that his nature is infinite goodness and love. To think like this all day long will be the most difficult thing, because the thought is so subtle. To speak in accordance with these truths will be easier if you are attentive. Acting in accordance with them will be the easier part, though it may require much moral courage. And being fully persuaded of the things which he had promised, he was able also to perform them. Romans 4, 21. Self-condemnation holds us back. People who are honestly trying to pursue the spiritual life often make the mistake of being too hard on themselves because they do not seem to be progressing as rapidly as they would naturally desire or because they find themselves repeating some old fault which they thought they had completely overcome, they feel discouraged and condemn themselves unmercifully. All this is nonsense. If you are doing all you can to use the truth you know, at this moment, you are doing all you have a right to expect of yourself. Do not be impatient with yourself, but this does not mean that you are lazy or complacent. Treat yourself as a wise parent treats a stubborn child, kindly, patiently, but with gentle firmness, not expecting too much too quickly, but foreseeing inevitable growth and improvement. And you are all children of the Most High. Psalm 82, 6. Reciprocal Judgment. These few verses consist of only about 100 words, and yet it is not too much to say that at their mere face value they constitute the most astounding document ever presented to mankind. In these five verses, we are told more about the nature of man and the meaning of life and the importance of conduct and the art of living and the secret of happiness and success and the way out of trouble and the approach to God and the emancipation of the soul and the salvation of the world than we have been told by all philosophers and theologians and sages put together, for it explains the Dafa. Go to hell with all the other books, for everything is in this one, would be valid to refer to those words. People are very prone to think, especially when they are strongly tempted, that they can probably escape the clutches of authority in some other way. However, if they understood that the law of retribution is a cosmic law, impersonal and immutable, like the law of gravity. They would think twice before treating other people unfairly. The law of gravity is never out of order, and no one would ever think of trying to circumvent it, or cajole it, or bribe it, or bully it. People accept it as inevitable and shape their behavior accordingly, and the law of retribution is just like the law of gravity. You may like or dislike the law, and if you wish, you may try to ignore it, but you cannot deny that Jesus Christ taught it and in the most direct and emphatic manner when he said, Judge not, that ye be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. Matthew 7, 1 and 2. With what measure ye meet it? With what measure ye meet it, it shall be measured unto you. Matthew 7, 2. If the common man were to understand for a moment the meaning of these words, they would turn his daily conduct upside down and change him in such a way that, in a comparatively short space of time, his closest friends would scarcely know him. The fact is that it is a law of life that as we think, speak, and act toward others, so will others think, speak, and act toward us. 
Everything we do to others, sooner or later someone somewhere will do to us, perhaps by someone who knows nothing of our previous action, but for every unkind word we say to another person or about another person, an unkind word will be said to us or about us. For every time we deceive, we will be deceived. Every time we neglect a duty or shirk a responsibility or abuse authority over other people, we are doing something for which we will inevitably have to pay by suffering similar harm ourselves. However, it is a bad law that it does not work both ways, so it is equally true that for every good deed you do, for every kind word you say, you will receive in the same way at some time or other an equivalent. The golden rule in scientific Christianity is, think of others as you would like them to think of you. In the light of the knowledge we now possess, the observance of this rule becomes a most solemn duty, but more than that, in fact, it is a debt of honor. The Gospel the student who has now acquired an understanding of what Duffer is and how it works is in a position to take the next great step and understand how it is possible to rise above even Duffer itself, in the name of Christ. This does not mean that the laws of the physical or mental planes are broken. It means that man, because of his essential divine being, has the power to rise above these realms into the infinity dimension of spirit, where such laws no longer affect him. The law of reaping what you sow, often called the law of karma, is in reality law only for the mind. It is not law for the spirit. In spirit all is perfect and eternal unchanging good. So man has the choice of karma or Christ. This is the best news that ever came to mankind, and that is why it is called the good news or the gospel. Karma turns out to be inexorable only as long as you do not pray. For any mistake you must suffer the consequences which we call being punished, or erase them by the practice of the presence of God. However, it should not be assumed that the consequences of a mistake can be cheaply evaded by superficial prayer. Sufficient realization of God is required to fundamentally alter the character of the sinner in order to erase the punishment which must otherwise always follow sin. When the sinner becomes a changed man and does not even desire to repeat his sin, then he is saved. For Christ is Lord of Karma. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. Guided Wisdom Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under foot, and turn and tear you in pieces. Matthew 7, 6. Intelligence is as essential a part of the Christian message as is love. God is love, but God is also infinite intelligence, and unless these two qualities are balanced in our lives, we will not gain wisdom, for wisdom is the perfect blend of intelligence and love. Love without intelligence can do much unwanted harm, and intelligence without love can end in intelligent cruelty. All true Christian activity will express wisdom. Never trust your own judgment to tell who is ready for the truth and who is not, but trust the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to guide you. If you are praying regularly each day for wisdom and new opportunities for service, the right people will be brought to you. Remember that those with whom you associate closely will have their personal conduct under constant inspection. The quickest way to spread the truth is to live the life yourself. Then people will notice the change in you and will come of their own free will begging to share your secret. Children of the Most High This is the wonderful passage in which Jesus enunciates the primary truth of the fatherhood of God. He says here, definitely and clearly, that the true relationship of God and man is that of father and son. It is extremely difficult to realize the momentous importance of this statement for the life of the soul. It is axiomatic, of course, that the offspring must be of the same nature and species as the parent, and so, if God and man are really father and son, man must also be essentially divine and susceptible of infinite development by the ascending path of divinity. That is, as man's true nature develops, he will expand in spiritual consciousness until he has transcended all limits of human imagination. It is in reference to our glorious destiny that Jesus himself says elsewhere, quoting the most ancient scripturis, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? 
if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. John 10, 34, and 35. Coming of Age For if ye then, being evil, know how to give good things unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Matthew 7, 11. We are children of God, and if children, then also children and co-heirs with Jesus Christ, as Paul says. At present we are full of limitations and incapacities, because spiritually we are nothing more than children. Children are irresponsible, they lack wisdom and experience, and we must keep them under control, so that their mistakes do not have serious consequences. That the heir, while he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors. Galatians 4.1 But when the fullness of time comes, he realizes that it is the voice of God himself that is in his heart, making him cry out, Abba, Father. Then at last he knows that he is the son of a great king, and that all that his father has is his for the use, whether it be health or provision or opportunity or beauty or joy or any other of God's thoughts. Unlimited generosity. The most mischievous thing in life is man's reluctance to perceive his own dominion. God has given us dominion over all things, but we shrink back like frightened children from assuming it, even though assuming it is the only way out for us. Jesus, who knew the human heart and understood our weakness in this regard, commands us, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Is this not the Magna Carta of personal freedom for every man, woman and child on earth? Is this not the decree of the emancipation of slaves from every kind of slavery, physical, mental or spiritual? We have no right to accept with resignation, ill health, poverty, sin, struggle, unhappiness or remorse. We have no right to accept anything but freedom, harmony and joy. Because only with these things do we glorify God and express His holy will, which is our reason for being. We must reorganize our lives according to His teachings, continuously and tirelessly, until we reach our goal. That this achievement, that our victory over every negative condition is not merely possible, but is definitely promised to us, finds its proof in these glorious words. The Golden Rule Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them, for this is the law of the prophets. Matthew 7, 12. Here, in the sublime precept we call the golden rule, Jesus reiterates that great law in a concise summary. This repetition follows his marvelous declaration of the fatherhood of God. The underlying explanation for the existence of the great law is the fact that we are all fundamentally parts of the great mind. Since we are all ultimately one, to hurt another is really to hurt oneself, and to help another is really to help oneself. The fatherhood of God compels us to accept the brotherhood of man, and spiritually, brotherhood is unity. The Narrow Gate Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. For straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 there is only one way under the sun by which man can attain salvation in the true sense of the word, and that is by bringing about a radical and permanent change for the better in his own consciousness. For countless generations, mankind has tried in every conceivable way to achieve its own good. This change of consciousness is the narrow gate of which Jesus speaks here, and as he says, the number of those who find it is comparatively small. Now why is man so reluctant, apparently, to attempt to change his conscience? The answer is that change of consciousness is really very hard work, requiring constant vigilance and a breaking of mental habits. However, getting on the straight path is worth far more than any trouble or effort it may require. If there is a qualitative change in consciousness, which is what happens in prayer, then not only do you feel the effect of that change in all aspects of your life, but it accompanies you for all eternity because you can never lose it. Thieves cannot break in and steal. As soon as you gain this spiritual awareness, 
you will discover that all things work for the good of those who love God. The gracious will of God. A tragic mistake often made is to suppose that the will of God is bound to be something very dull and unattractive, if not positively unpleasant. Consciously or not, some people regard God as a harsh taskmaster or a stern parent. Too often their prayers are reduced to something like this, please God grant me such and such a blessing which I so badly need, but I suppose you won't, because you won't think it's good for me. Needless to say, such a prayer is answered as all prayers are answered, according to the faith of the subject. That is, the blessing is not granted. The truth is that God's will for us always means a greater freedom, a greater personal expression, a newer and brighter experience, a broader opportunity to serve others, a more abundant life. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. John 4, 16. Giving fruit. If man were really left without a simple practical test of religious truth, he would certainly be in a sad plight, but happily this is not the case. Jesus, the most profound and at the same time the simplest and most practical teacher the world has ever known, has supplied this need and has given us a universal test of truth. It is as simple and direct as the acid test for gold. It is the simple question, does truth work in our lives? This test is so amazingly simple that most intelligent people have overlooked it. Truth heals the body, purifies the soul, reforms the sinner, resolves difficulties, pacifies strife. There is no such thing as unproven understanding. If you want to know how you are spiritually, look around you beginning with the body. There can be nothing in the soul that is not sooner or later demonstrated outwardly, and there can be nothing outwardly that does not find some correspondence inwardly. By their fruits ye shall know them. Matthew 7.20 unceasing vigilance. We are all willing to do God's will at times and in some things, but until there is complete dedication of our whole being, there can be no complete demonstration. There is no home for the soul in which dwells the shadow of a falsehood, said George Meredith. Never is it truer than in the life of the soul that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. We must allow no consideration, no institution, no organization, no book, no man or woman, to stand between us and our direct pursuit of God. Centers, churches, schools, all fill a useful purpose in providing the physical framework for the distribution of correct knowledge, but the real work must be done by the individual. Not everyone who says to me, he shall not enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. A Rock Foundation Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. Matthew 7, 24. One of the oldest symbols of the human soul is that of a building, sometimes a dwelling, sometimes a temple. The first thing the builder of a house must do is to choose a solid foundation. In the shifting sands of the desert, it is impossible to build anything. So when the desert dweller sets out to erect a permanent structure, he looks for a rock. Rock is one of the biblical terms for Christ, and the implication is very obvious. Christ is the only foundation upon which we can safely build the temple of the regenerated soul. As long as we depend on anything less than that rock on willpower, on so-called material security, on the goodwill of others, or on our own personal resources, we are building on sand, and great will be our fall. Final Authority And it came to pass that when Jesus finished these words, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Matthew 7, 28 and 29. It is always like this. The message of Jesus Christ is totally revolutionary because it directs our gaze from the outside to the inside and from man and his works to God. He taught as one who has authority. The greatest glory of the spiritual foundation is that you begin to know when you have obtained the smallest demonstration through prayer, you have experienced something that never leaves you. You have the testimony of truth within you, and this is the only authority worth having. Worship means victory. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 29, 2. God is greater than any problem. God in you is greater than any difficulty you have to face. 
God cares for you more than any human being can realize. God can help you in proportion to the degree to which you worship Him. You worship God by actually putting your trust in Him rather than in external conditions or fear or depression or apparent dangers and so on. You worship God by acknowledging His presence everywhere in all the people and conditions you encounter and by praying regularly. You pray well when you pray with joy. Glory ye in His holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Psalm 105, 3. Taking material steps. When you set out to solve a problem by prayer, you must also take all the normal steps. Don't just pray and then sit back and wait for something dramatic to happen. For example, if you are praying for a job, you should pray for it as well as you know how every day. And then go out and visit agencies or prospective employers, write applications or insert ads in appropriate periodicals. If you desire a cure, deal with it as you think best. And in addition, take such material steps as you see fit. If your business is not thriving, give yourself a checkup to find out if you are managing it effectively. If you find weaknesses, as you almost certainly will, you should correct them immediately. Certainly we cannot pretend to keep breaking the laws of the plane on which we live and expect prayer to compensate for this folly. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Ecclesiastes 9, 10. The Mental Equivalent There is one thing that means more to us than all other things in the world, and that is our search for God and the understanding of His nature. Our goal is to learn the practice of the presence of God. We practice the presence of God by seeing Him everywhere, in all things and in all people. Some years ago, I coined the phrase mental equivalent. For whatever you desire in your life, a healthy body, a fulfilling vocation, friends, opportunities, and above all, an understanding of God, you must provide a mental equivalent. Provide yourself a mental equivalent, and the thing will come to you. This expression, mental equivalent, is taken from physics and chemistry. We talk about the mechanical equivalent of heat, and engineers have to constantly calculate the equivalent of one kind of energy in another kind of energy. They have to figure out how much coal it takes to produce that much electricity and so on. Similarly, there is a mental equivalent of every object or event on the physical plane. The secret of success in life is to build the mental equivalent you want, and to get rid of the mental equivalent you don't want. I will meditate on thy precepts and I will respect thy ways. Psalm 119, 15. Clarity and interest. The key to life is to build the mental equivalence of what you want and eliminate the equivalence of what you don't want. Mental equivalents are built by thinking with clarity or definition and interest. Remember that clarity and interest are the two poles. If you want to be healthy, happy, prosperous, do constructive work, have a continuous understanding of God, you think, feel, and are interested in these ends. What we call feeling in relation to thinking is really interest. 99 times out of 100, the reason Christians fail to manifest is that they lack feeling in their desires or prayers. How are you going to eliminate wrong mental equivalents? Suppose you have a mental equivalent of resentment or unemployment or criticism or not understanding God. The only way to eliminate an erroneous mental equivalent is to provide it with the opposite. Right thinking automatically expunges wrong thinking. If you say, I'm not going to think about resentment anymore, what are you thinking about except resentment? The key to managing your thinking, and therefore the key to managing your destiny, is to replace a negative thought with an affirmative thought. The Lord will perfect that which troubles me. Psalm 138, 8. E.C. You do it. What you concentrate on you bring into your life. Many people fail to concentrate successfully because they think that concentration means willpower. They assume that the harder they try, the faster they succeed. But this is a mistake. Think of the photographic process. The secret to a sharp image lies in focus. Focus your camera lens steadily for as long as it takes. Suppose I want to photograph a vase of flowers. I place them in front of the camera and hold them there. But suppose after a few moments, I remove the vase and put a book in front of the camera, and then I remove it and put a chair, and then I put the flowers back for a few moments. You know what will happen to my photograph. It will be blurry. Isn't that what people do with their minds? 
when they can't keep their thoughts focused for a while. They think about health for a few minutes, and then they think about illness or fear. They think prosperity, and then depression. Is it any wonder that man is so prone to demonstrate the spoiled image? It is always good to make a practical experiment, so I advise you to take just one problem in your life and simply change your thinking regarding your problem and keep it changed for a month, and you will be amazed at the results. If you really keep your thinking changed, you won't have to wait a month to get results. He who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24, 13 Keeping the new equivalent. There is an instructive legend from the Middle Ages. It seems that a certain citizen was arrested by one of the barons and locked in a dungeon by a fierce-looking jailer who carried a large key. The door of his cell was closed with a sharp blow. He remained in the dark dungeon for 20 years. Every day the great door was opened with a great creaking sound, water and breed were brought in and then locked it again. At the end of 20 years, the prisoner decided that he wanted to die but he did not want to commit suicide, so the next day when the jailer arrived, he would attack him and the jailer would kill him. To prepare himself, he thought he should examine the door, so he turned the handle and to his surprise the door opened. He checked that there was no lock. He groped his way down the hallway and up the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs, two soldiers were chatting with him and did not try to stop him. He crossed the large courtyard. There was an armed guard on the drawbridge but he paid no attention to him and went out as a free man. He returned home unmolested. He had been a captive, not of stone and iron, but of false beliefs. He had thought only that he was locked up. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou wilt be bountiful unto me. Psalm 142.7 What Moses means today Moses was a man of extraordinary understanding of God and man. He was also one of the great historical leaders of the human race. He was born in Egypt, which at that time was the most civilized country in the world. But at that time, the authorities gave orders to kill the male children of the Israelites, and Moses' mother tried to save his life by putting him in a small basket and hiding him on the bank of the river, where Pharaoh's daughter could not avoid seeing him when she approached the river to bathe. Moses' sister was told to hide among the tall reeds to guard the baby. The king's daughter saw this little basket, opened it, and when the child cried, her heart was moved. She looked around and out came the sister, and you know the rest of the story, how the sister was sent for a woman to take care of the child, and she brought Moses' own mother. Now there is a remarkable text here. Pharaoh's daughter says to the woman, Take this child and take care of him for me, and I will give you your wages. Exodus 2 9. In the biblical sense, you are the king's daughters as soon as you attain truth. The child Moses is that higher teaching that brings out your heart. Now then, how do we nourish our Moses child? By prayer and meditation. Otherwise, the child will starve. However, if we take the child and nurse it, we will get our wages, and our wages will be freedom, peace of mind, harmony, understanding, and the communion of God himself. The Ten Commandments. And God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant and kept them. Exodus 2, 24 and 25. Moses grew up as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, with all the privileges and training of royalty. As the years passed and he witnessed the oppression of his people, he decided to lead them out of their slavery and into a better life, his promised land. We are told, their cry went up to God. Exodus 2, 24. And God himself led them safely through their wilderness. Then at the time of their uncertainty, their moral laxity, and their emotional turmoil, he gave Moses certain basic rules of life, which we still know as the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments at face value are true and valid, but that is only the beginning. If people are to escape the continual struggles of life, they must have something more. So within these commandments, he hid the deeper laws for those who were ready for them, and within them he hid the deepest and highest spiritual teachings for those who were ready for them. In other words, Moses designed these laws of life so that the higher we go spiritually or the deeper we go intellectually, the more we can draw from them. Elevated Consciousness, the First Commandment I am the Lord thy God, 
who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus 20, 2 and 3. Moses lived in Egypt over 3,000 years ago and led some 600,000 people out of Egypt and through the wilderness. That is historical. But Moses also represents a faculty in you, and the things Moses did typify your mental states. The mountain signifies prayer, the heightened consciousness. We are told that the general public was not allowed to go up Mount Sinai, but that does not mean that certain people were not good enough to go up. It means that if we want to go up the mountain, if we want to raise our consciousness, if we want to get closer to God, we must prepare ourselves by prayer. If we want to go up the mountain, we have to become spiritually a high priest and we have to rid ourselves of our faults and weaknesses, otherwise we will not be able to raise our consciousness and get our contact with God. Moses had his revelation, and then he realized it as the experience that God and man are one. When he had that revelation, Moses brought the laws of life, beginning with the first commandment, as we call it. What is the beginning of the first commandment? I am the Lord your God. Our problem in our religious life is almost always that we think, in the beginning I, that is very human, that is very human, but it does not get us the revelation that Moses got. After affirming, I am the Lord your God, the first commandment says you shall have no other gods before me. Pocket gods and graven images. The second commandment, thou shalt not take unto thee any graven image. Exodus 20, 4. A primitive people needed to be so instructed because they were so given to making idols of a palpable kind. We do not do these things, but every time we give power to anything other than God, we are making that thing a graven image. For example, we give power to our ailments, particularly if it is a favorite ailment. We all know people who say, my rheumatism, and they say it with great fondness. It's been with them for a long time. It has become a topic of conversation. Others say, my indigestion. We are making an image of these things. Only when we take power away from them can we heal them. If you forget God and worship graven images of any kind, you are going to suffer. You can demolish a stone statue, you can burn a wooden one. The way to destroy mental images is to stop thinking about them and giving them power. This commandment goes on to say, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Moses does not mean that God is jealous as a man, but that God must have first place. The problem with many godly people is that they want God to be vice president, reserving the presidency for themselves. That is why the Bible uses the word jealous, in the sense that if you give power to anything other than God, you have lost God altogether. You can't have a percentage of God. Either God is the only power, or nothing at all. Thoughts are things. The third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Exodus 20, 7. Now this law of life really means that you cannot take the name of the Lord in vain. If you try to do so, you will fail, because when you take the name of God for yourself and put it into practice, then the consequences will come. It is a pity that many of us do not realize this fact, because we are constantly trying to take the name of the Lord in vain. The name of God is your conviction about God. Your idea of God will determine your whole life. If you believe that God is good, God is love, God has all power, God is intelligence, all the conditions of your life will constantly improve. If you believe that God is intelligent but not good, I know people would not dare to say that, but people who think that God sends sickness and trouble really believe in a God who is not good. If you believe in a God who has all intelligence but is not loving, then your idea of the nature of God must work. Trouble will come to you, and you will not get over it because you say, God sent this trouble for a good purpose and I must endure it. You will endure it. Your idea of God cannot be in vain. It will work for you according to your belief. There is not one of us who is not limiting God in some aspect of his thinking, and so we will suffer limitation in some way, because we cannot take God's name in vain. A time to rest. The fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Exodus 28. This commandment about the Sabbath day was given to the people at the time of leaving Egypt and going into the wilderness, and apparently meant what it said for that time. 
In Moses' time, it was a wonderful thing to insist that everyone set aside one day a week to think about God, or at least to force him to give up his secular activities. No rule can make a man religious or give him faith, but it can help. Like all the other commandments, this one is an instruction to seek God's presence everywhere, particularly where there seems to be trouble. Where there is fear and doubt, he brings faith. Where there is lack, he brings abundance. But here, in this commandment about the Sabbath, there is an even deeper meaning. When you pray every day and recognize that God is at work in you and in all your affairs, there will be a sense in which every day will be a Sabbath, because to you, every day will be a holy day. One of the most wonderful things about biblical teaching is that we get rid of the distinction between the sacred and the secular. That is one of the most important steps in the whole history of the soul. God is present everywhere. For those who understand the teaching of Jesus, it is always the Sabbath and the place where they stand is holy ground. Polarity, the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Exodus 20, 12. We are to respect our parents just because they are our parents, but that teaching is only the outer layer of this commandment. Underneath it is instruction in divine metaphysics because your true father and mother is God. When this commandment says, honor your father and mother, it introduces the two poles, male and female, and of course polarity is the driving force of the universe. In the Bible, mother means the feeling nature, and father is the knowing nature. Most people have one side or the other more developed. When our prayers fail and we do not manifest, we fail because we are not honoring our father and mother. Express who you are. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Exodus 20, 13. As rules of conduct, the commandments are, thou shalt not do like the ones you see written. No smoking or no driving in the street, but when one gets behind the superficial meaning, then thou shalt not becomes thou mayest not. So this commandment, thou shalt not kill, is fundamentally an expression of the cosmic law that you can't kill, and the sooner you figure it out, the better. We are always trying to kill. However, this commandment is here to tell us that to think that we can kill something is to create problems for ourselves that we will have to face and eliminate at some point, Nothing dies from the outside. No one can kill your character. No one can kill your peace of mind. No one can kill your business or your reputation or anything that is yours. You can, but no one else can. No man or woman has ever been destroyed from the outside. Many people waste their lives thinking about how they are being hurt or damaged or harmed by other people. About how good they could be, what wonderful things they could do if it weren't for others. As long as you believe that, you can't make progress. As soon as you know that no one can hurt you, then you will be free to overcome any mistakes and to be and do whatever you want. False loyalty, the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery, Exodus 20, 14. Naturally, this commandment means what it says. The standard of Christian conduct with regard to personal purity can never be improved. Not committing adultery is fundamentally important because the sanctity of the family is based on it. But of course, there is much more to it than that. One of the most common Hebrew synonyms was adultery for idolatry. In the Old Testament, these two words are almost always interchangeable. The worship of false gods was described as adultery. The fundamental idea of this commandment is to have one God. As you read through the Old Testament, you will find that the idea of the adulterous wife who is unfaithful to her husband constantly means the human soul turning away to some other god. By right of conscience, the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal, Exodus 20, 15. Many people will say, we have always known that we should not steal. If we do, we will get in trouble and probably end up in jail. Throughout the ages, only a small percentage of human beings have stolen. Respect for the property of others was learned very early in the history of civilization. However, this fundamental law of life means that we can't actually steal. Let's say you know someone who broke into your house and took your money. The thief who took your money actually transferred some money from your house to someone else's house, but did he get away with it? If that money belonged to you by right of conscience, 
All the thieves in the world couldn't have taken it. In fact, if you had this understanding, you could take a $10 bill, put it on the sidewalk in Times Square, and come back the next day, and it would still be there. Your awareness of God's presence in other people would have been so strong that no one could have taken from you what belonged to you by right of that awareness. These ten laws of life are things that cannot be done, and so, says the great prophet in effect, don't waste your life trying to do these things. They cannot be done, they conflict with the fundamental law of being. When we stop trying to steal, we will begin to have our own. We will have our own rights, and when we get that, liberation will not be far behind. The True Witness The Ninth Commandment Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Exodus 20, 16 First of all, the obvious meaning is very important, although it is only the principle. Do not tell lies about people. We have to apply this principle of not bearing false witness throughout our whole life. It is very important to practice it because what you say about another person will happen to yourself. If you lie about another person, it's a nasty word, but I use it because it's the right word. Someone will lie about you. Jesus says it in the seventh chapter of Matthew, verses 1 and 2. Judge not, that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. However, the fundamental meaning of this commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness, is that you always express what you are. You cannot be one thing and express another. Emerson says, What you are screams so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. We are always bearing witness to what we are. So, again, thou shalt not really means thou canst not. You cannot permanently bear false witness. True testimony is the full expression of the man of God. You will be bearing true witness to your neighbor when you are regenerated in soul. What does regeneration mean? It means building a new soul, not correcting the old one. When you change the soul, automatically the flesh changes, the skin changes, the blood vessels and nerves and bones change. But regeneration must begin with a change in the soul, not with anything in the outside world. When we really know these things, we will be bearing true witness. God's abundance for your need. The Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's. Exodus 20, 17. There are several phrases concerning covetousness, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, nor his wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his cattle, nor anything that is his. Much of the evil in the world is caused by desiring something to which one has no right. Moses knew what coveting does to us in what we today call the unconscious or the subconscious. Coveting affects the soul of man. Even if your greed never leads you to take something that does not belong to you, it undermines and ultimately rots your soul. It takes you away from God. Why? Because to covet something means that you do not understand the law of being. You don't understand that everything you receive or lack is the representation and expression of your consciousness. Until you understand that you cannot be saved, there is nothing in the world that you have conceived that God does not have in abundance. God's supply is infinite and to envy another because he seems to have more is to deny your own contact with God. I am that I am. And there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud. Exodus 19.16 These are dramatic expressions of the shift in consciousness as we move away from the common things of life to the higher things. In these days of the Exodus, the conditions of the outer world responded very quickly to man's thoughts because the people believed it was possible. Moses led his people through the Red Sea by the power of thought, and he was able to do so because in those days the people believed in the power of thought. They believed that God could take them through the Red Sea dry shod, and he did. Moses had the true knowledge of God from his father's people, the Hebrews. The historical mission of the Hebrews was to teach that God is not a limited corporeal being, but incorporeal, infinite, a divine mind. Moses saw clearly the unity of God and man, and the unity of man and man. He had more than a glimmer of what we call cosmic consciousness. That was his illumination. Then he realized that he must give this to mankind. Take God for a partner. Why not organize the business of living large? Why crawl, as some people do, from one small rung to another, instead of stepping out boldly? 
Why be content with poor health, uninteresting work, or limited conditions when many other people have already risen above these things? There is a way out of limitation that never fails. It is this. Take God for your partner. If you really make God your partner in all departments of your life, you will be surprised at the quick and surprising results you will get. Of course, if you want God to be your partner, you will have to include Him in every corner and every phase of your life. Most people would be delighted to be able to partner with some great industrial or financial magnate. They would feel that their future is secure. But here a partnership with infinite wisdom and infinite power awaits you. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same beareth much fruit. For apart from me ye can do nothing. John 15, 5 The Secret Place the 91st Psalm is one of the greatest chapters of the Bible. Like the rest of Scripture, the underlying thought is developed through a series of symbols, and it is by appreciating the values behind these symbols that the power of this prayer is appropriated. The way to get the most out of this Psalm is to read it silently, pausing after each clause to reflect on its meaning and accept it mentally. If you are afraid, you will find, after reading the prayer two or three times, that your fear has disappeared and you now see things from a different point of view. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91, 1. The secret place of the Most High is your own consciousness, and this fact is the most important practical discovery in the science of religion. The mistake often made is to suppose that the secret place of the Most High is somewhere outside oneself, a mistake fatal to our hopes for our success in prayer depends upon our achieving some degree of contact with God, and since He can only be contacted within, so long as we are looking outward, we shall fail in our objective. Jesus emphasized this truth. The kingdom of God is within you. Again He said that when we pray, we must enter the closet and close the door, that is, withdraw in thought into our own consciousness. In fact, this doctrine of the secret place and the wonders that can occur therein is taught throughout the Bible. The Shadow of the Almighty To dwell under the shadow of the Almighty means to live under the protection of God Himself. Eastern peoples, and especially those of desert origin, such as the people of Palestine, regard the sun as a danger, even an enemy, from which they need protection. The shadow is sanctuary or security the shadow of a mighty rock in a weary land. The exhausted traveler sinks into the shadow to rest. God is called the Almighty to impress us with the fact that He really is Almighty and therefore can overcome our present difficulty, no matter how great it may seem. For with God all things are possible. Mark 10, 27. Consider, however, that the promise is made to Him that dwelleth. If we only run to the secret place from time to time, we can hardly be said to dwell there. God will come to our aid whenever we pray, but if we seldom think of Him, we may experience difficulty in getting in touch in case of emergency. Through daily meditation, we dwell in the secret place. Our strength. Notice that the poem begins by announcing the irresistible power of prayer, then to make us understand that this law applies to us and that we could in no way be an exception it now switches to the first person and makes us say, I. It forces us to express the I am. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. The Lord means God. How can knowledge be a presence? Secular knowledge, which is intellectual, cannot. But true knowledge of God is a real experience, not a thing of the head but of the heart. And this is a presence. As a rule, People come in contact with this real being only vaguely and occasionally. Then, if they pray regularly, the flashes of intuition gradually strengthen into a definite sense of the presence of God. In Him I will trust. No matter how worried or depressed you may be, no matter how many doubts and misgivings you may have, the fact that you are praying means that you at least have enough faith to do so. The faith to keep praying in the midst of doubts about results is the small mustard seed that Jesus says, is sufficient for practical purposes. Declaring in Him I will trust means that you have now decided to trust by ceasing to worry and fear. This is the legitimate and spiritual use of the will, our deliverance. And now, the word of truth is represented as addressing you 
with an authoritative assurance that your prayer will be answered, that in one way or another, not necessarily in the way you expect, you will be rescued from your difficulty. Surely he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thee shield and buckler. You need not fear, for your protection is now secured in one of those illustrations of daily life in which the Bible abounds. The mother hen, at the least threat of danger, gathers the chicks under her wings, covering them with her feathers. Thus God protects you from all danger once you have chosen to trust in Him. His truth will be your shield and breastplate. It is the knowledge of truth about God and man that makes the demonstration. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flieth by day, nor of the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor of the destruction that wasteth at noonday. The arrow that flames by day and the destruction that ravages the noonday refer to any difficulty of which you are aware. It is, so to speak, a diurnal problem. The night terror and the pestilence that walks in the dark, on the other hand, imply something that, unknown to you, is at work in your subconscious mind. Modern psychology has shown that most of our difficulties have their roots deep in the subconscious. They are, in effect, terrors of the mental night and pestilences of darkness. Our promise, a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but they shall not come near thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. This clause has been taken to indicate some kind of favoritism on God's part, whereas of course such a thing is impossible. It simply means that those who pray are saved from troubles which would otherwise overtake them, and which, in fact, overtake those who do not pray. For thou hast made the Lord my refuge, the Most High thy dwelling place. No evil shall befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling place. In the Bible, the word promise is the name given to a statement of some spiritual law. Thus, a biblical promise is a statement of the consequences that naturally follow from certain states of consciousness. If Boyle's law were written in biblical language, it would read something like this. As I live, saith the Lord, whenever you double the pressure of a gas, you will halve its volume, the temperature remaining constant. In the language of natural science, our biblical promise would read, By meditating regularly on the presence of God with you, and directing your life in accordance with that fact, you become immune to every kind of danger. Triumph over danger. Thou shalt tread down the lion and the viper, the lion's whelp and the dragon thou shalt trample under foot. Here the lion represents a difficulty of which we are so afraid that it seems to us like a lion itself in our path, pouncing upon us in the open field. On the other hand, how different is the attack of the viper or serpent, for it creeps upon us in the dark. And here we are promised that our complexes, however dragonish they may be, will be dissolved by the realization of God. There is nothing that can be done by any form of psychotherapy that cannot be done better by the practice of the presence of God. The last three verses are in themselves a glorious psalm of resounding joy and triumph. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. There is nothing hypothetical or contingent here. The statement indicates the fixed decision, I will deliver him. And why? Because he has set his love in me. I will set him on high because he has known my name. In the Bible, the name of anything signifies the nature or character of that thing. Now the nature of God is perfect, omnipresent, all-powerful, good, boundless love. And to know, this is to be set on high above all our difficulties. The last two lines take up all the implications and promises of this wonderful poem and present them to the fearful or doubting heart as a song of triumph. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Bluebeard draws the line. We progress spiritually by putting God in every corner of our lives. Most people on the spiritual path are willing to give God a generous portion of their lives, but often there is a little corner where they do not want the divine light to shine. Bluebeard, as you will recall, kept the house open with the exception of one small room, and there he drew the line. His present wife, or any of the neighbors, could walk the entire compound and be welcome until they came to that small room Bluebeard's chamber. 
which was forbidden. However, that small locked room contained the tragedy of the house. The contents of Bluebeard's room need not be anything we usually call horrible. It may simply be selfishness, laziness, spiritual pride, or any of the more respectable but very deadly sins. There may be an old grudge or bitter remorse. Open all the doors of your soul to God. Have no place where the light of His presence does not shine. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. Deuteronomy 29, 29. God says now, God's time for your manifestation is now. God's time for you to be healed is now. The time God wants you to be in your true place is now. The Bible says the day of salvation is now. God is ready the moment you are ready. There is nothing to wait for except the change of your own consciousness. People often make the mistake of saying, I know my manifestation will come at the right time, but the only time to be harmonious and satisfied is now. The time to be happy is now, and the place is here. Didn't Jesus say, the kingdom of heaven is near, and by this he meant near? Do not keep yourself out of the kingdom of heaven by inventing postponements, but change your consciousness now, for everything can happen in a moment, that it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed, Romans 13, 11. You are always trying. You are continually dealing with your conditions with the thoughts you have about them. What you actually think about anything is your dealing with that thing. Many people have the idea that they are only treating when they call it treatment, but no matter what you call it, your thinking regarding any subject is treatment. This is why visible conditions are always the expression of an invisible thought. If you systematically begin to treat every aspect of your life with a series of positive and correct thoughts, and stick to this practice for even a few weeks, you will be surprised to discover how much everything will change for the better. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. Your invisible dictaphone. Your destiny depends entirely on your own mental conduct. You may think you already know it, but if you do not act accordingly, it is certain that you do not really know it. Most people would be astonished to discover how much negative thinking they indulge in. The thinking is so quick and the habit so strong that unless you are very careful, you will constantly transgress. Suppose that first thing tomorrow morning, without our noticing it, we were to put an invisible dictaphone on our shoulders and carry it about with us all day until late tomorrow night. Suppose then that this recording were played back to you, so that all the words you have uttered during a whole day were repeated to you. If you were an ordinary human being, you would probably feel embarrassed. However, it really happens that everything we say, think and do is recorded in the subconscious mind, and our daily experience is nothing more than that recording played back by the law of being. Never forget that the circumstances of your life tomorrow are shaped by your mental conduct today. I have chosen the way of truth. Psalm 119.30 Falter your life. There is no need to be unhappy. There is no need to be disappointed or oppressed or wronged. There is no need for sickness or failure or discouragement. There is no need for anything but abundant interest and joy in life. So long as you accept a negative condition at its own valuation, so long will you remain enslaved to it. But you have only to assert your birthright as a free man or woman, and you will be free. Success and happiness are the natural conditions of humanity. In fact, it is easier to demonstrate these things than the reverse. Bad habits of thought and action may obscure this fact for a time, just as a wrong way of walking or sitting, or of holding a pen or a musical instrument, may seem easier than the right way because we have become accustomed to it. But the right way is nevertheless the easiest. Unhappiness, frustration, poverty, loneliness, are really bad habits which their victims have become accustomed to endure, believing that there is no way out, whereas there is a way, and that way is simply to acquire good habits of working with the law instead of against it. Open my eyes that I may see the wonders of your law. Psalm 119, 18. Do not accept second choices. In the depths of his being, man always intuitively feels that there is a way out of his difficulties if only he is able to find it. The infant, not yet tainted by the defeatism of his elders, simply refuses to tolerate disharmony on any terms 
and therefore manifests over it. When he is hungry, he tells the world, while many a sophisticated adult goes without food. Does he find himself with a pin stuck somewhere in his anatomy? It is not for him a sigh of resignation at the supposed will of God, nor a whine about never being lucky, nor a sigh that one must endure what cannot be cured. Your instinct tells you that life and harmony are inseparable, refuse to tolerate anything that is not harmony, you can have a happy and joyful life, but to do so, you must take the helm of your own destiny and boldly steer toward the harbour you intend. What are you doing with your future? For not the hearers of the law are righteous before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Romans 2, 13. The Four Horsemen The Four Horsemen of Revelation give the key to the nature of man as we know him. When you thoroughly understand these symbols, you will understand your own constitution and you can begin the work of gaining mastery over yourself and your surroundings. The Bible is not written in the style of a modern book. It has its own method of transmitting knowledge through picturesque symbols, the reason being that this is the only possible way in which knowledge can be given to people of all ages, in different parts of the world, and of different degrees of spiritual development. A symbol appeals to any audience. Each individual receives just what he or she is prepared for. The four horsemen of the apocalypse represent the four parts or elements of our human nature. First, there is the physical body, what you see when you look through the glass. Then there is your feeling nature or emotions. And although you cannot see your feelings, you are tremendously aware of them. Third, there is your intellect, which contains all the knowledge you possess. Finally, there is your spiritual nature, your true eternal self, the real you, the I am, the indwelling Christ. This is your true identity which is eternal. Almost everyone believes in its existence, but most people are very unaware of it as a reality. Eventually the time will come when the first three will merge into the fourth, and then we will all know it instead of believing only that the spiritual nature is everything. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13 three wild horses. And I looked, and behold a pale horse, and he that sat on him was called Death, and Hell followed him. Revelation 6, 8. The first horse is the pale horse, and pale means the color of terror, a kind of ashen gray. The pale horse represents the physical body. If you live for the body, only Hell awaits you on this plane or any other. The body is the cruelest master of all, when it is allowed to rule. The pale horse also indicates all other physical addictions, what the Bible sometimes calls the world, money, position, material honors. The one who lives for worldly interests is the rider of the pale horse. And there went out another pale horse, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. Revelation 6, 4. The red horse is your emotional nature, your feelings. It is dangerous to allow your emotions to be in control. This does not mean that emotion is a bad thing in itself. Uncontrolled emotion is a bad thing. A strong emotional nature is a splendid endowment if you master it, but if it masters you, you are riding the red horse. And I looked, and behold a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Revelation 6, 5. A pair of scales is here symbolic of imbalance. The black horse represents the intellect, to ride the black horse is to let your intellect dominate to the exclusion of the emotional, and especially the spiritual nature. It is good to have the intellect well trained, but it is a disgrace to let it be the master. Western civilization has definitely ridden the black horse since the end of the Middle Ages. Mankind has developed scientific and intellectual knowledge far beyond the point to which it has developed the moral and spiritual understanding of the race the conquering horse. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Revelation 6, 2. The white horse is the spiritual nature, and the man or woman who rides the white horse attains freedom and joy and ultimate happiness and harmony. We are told two very interesting things about the rider of the white horse. The Bible says that the one who sat upon him had a bow, the bow and arrow are an ancient symbol of the spoken word. When you speak the word, you shoot an arrow. 
It goes where you point it. The rider of the white horse speaks the word. The white horse rider also wears a crown, and the crown is a symbol of victory. The rider of the white horse is always the victor. This, then, is the story of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. If you want peace, the understanding of God, there is only one way. You must ride the white horse. The Book of Genesis Genesis means origin or beginning, and this, the first book of the Bible, explains how things and conditions come into existence. Genesis deals with this creative power of thought. The first section deals with generic thought. The second, the story of Adam and Eve, deals with specific thought, or how a given person constructs all the conditions that exist in his or her life. The sections dealing with Cain and Abel, the Tower of Babel, the Flood, the story of Abraham and his family, the story of Joseph and his brothers, all deal in different ways with the creative power of thought, showing how it is the genesis of all things that exist. The book of Genesis is partly allegorical and partly historical. Unless one understands the spiritual meaning behind the story, one does not own the Bible at all. The Sinai Covenant, necessary and good in its place, signifies the attempt to order things from without and is, of course, far better than anarchy. But he who is on the spiritual path must pass beyond this to the spiritual Jerusalem, which is the ordering of things from within by the practice of the presence of God. This is the new Jerusalem which comes down from heaven directly from God. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Revelation 21, 2. Once the creative power of thought is explained in the book of Genesis, the other books of the Bible illustrate the operation of the laws of thought in different circumstances, but Genesis is the foundation of all. The Tower of Babel And the whole earth had one language and one speech. Genesis 11.1 1. The story of the Tower of Babel is so simple, so concrete and so clear, that if you heard it only once as a child, you could never forget it. It is, of course, a parable. The word Babel means confusion and this parable teaches that when you deny God's omnipotence and you do so whenever you give power to anything else, confusion can only follow. To be guilty of that sin is really to have many gods, and that was the characteristic defect of the heathen. Those who knew the truth about God worshipped him and him alone and received the protection and inspiration that truth alone can give. Sometimes, however, many of those who had known the truth forgot it for a season and inevitably things began to go wrong. If you find yourself in difficulties of any kind, it is certain that in some way you have been committing the sin of the heathen. It may be that at one time or another you have seen the higher and deliberately chosen the lower. Now, if you turn to God once more and reaffirm your faith in Him, all will be well again. Dwelling in Sinar The story of the Tower of Babel begins by saying that the whole earth had one language and one tongue, that is, there was unity of thought and expression. Your faith was firm and dynamic. Then they allowed their consciousness to wane. And it came to pass as they went from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and dwelt there. Genesis 11, 2. The plain signifies any kind of negative thinking as opposed to the hill or mountain, which represents prayer or spiritual vision. The Bible mentions that they dwelt in that plain or in that state of mind, it is not an occasional negative thought that does the damage, it is the thought or false belief that is dwelt in that causes the problem. Habitual wrong thinking, false beliefs, long held, build both a conscious and subconscious conviction that we have to trust ourselves. Of course, nothing could be more discouraging than such an idea, and in turn produces more fear. In the parable, these people had the absurd idea that they could reach heaven, regain harmony, by building a material tower. This describes that sense of insecurity and apprehension that has always plagued most of humanity because they have not realized the presence and power of God and their essential oneness with Him. Then the account says that the Lord scattered the people and confused their tongues so that they did not understand one another. The confusion of tongues is a graphic description of the state of mind of those who have not yet begun to center their lives in God for only fear and chaos can come to them until they do.